Noise and Havoc. Welcome to Booktopia. Thank you. What do you think fiction can do that non-fiction can't do? Oh, um, well, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, I think fiction and non-fiction blur into each other. Yeah. So there can be a lot of stuff uh, in a book of fiction that might actually be grounded in reality and a lot of stuff that is ostensibly non-fiction that lies to us and isn't true. Um, but but one thing which fiction can do is it, it, it frees us from the constraint of, you know, what is real and, and lets us explore a little bit. And I think that's important. Um, I think also fiction is, is an invitation to make believe. Um, my, I have two little kids and so at any given moment my five-year-old daughter will be pretending to be a princess or pretending to be a fish or pretending to be, you know, an eagle. And, um, and she slips into this world of make-believe, and it's, a, I think, a very human instinct. And when we are adults, we really don't do that much. Um, and I think a novel is an invitation to kind of slip into that world of make-believe, which is, a, which is I, I think, a pretty important human um, need. Yeah. I think what makes you um, your writing so important as well when we talk about it is how you experiment with the form as well. Um, I know when I was learning uh, writing, I, I, the reluctant fundamentalist was that a classic case of this huge locked-in structure that it still intimidates me to this day. I don't know how you pull it <laughs> off. Um, how important is, is it for you to experiment with form with trying to get through with stories? I mean, it's hugely important for me. Yeah. So um, I think that uh, I, I spend about six or seven years on my novels, and they're pretty short novels, six or seven years each. Mm. Um, in fact, they're so short and it takes so long that my agent sometimes calls me the reluctant novelist. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it's a funny thing. Um, and I'm always trying to figure out how to tell the story. Um, I think there is a way to tell a story um, that's appropriate to that story, and I never know what it's going to be. So the Latin Fundamentalist, which you which you just mentioned, um, you know, began as kind of a straightforward. Actually, it began as a kind of almost like a parable in the third person yeah. about this character, um, like a folk story, and then it became a first person narrative in an almost American accent. And then it later evolved into the second person where the main character is addressing to the character called you, yeah. uh, who's potentially an American with a buzz haircut. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, form is, is really important because uh, um, the, the novel is itself artificial, right? You have mm. to kind of suspend disbelief that this, this, you know, these pages with text on them. Um, are really a story. Something has to happen. And so there's a conventional way of doing it, which is just, hey, it's a novel, um, you know, go ahead and suspend this belief. Um, or there's a way which I, I find more attractive, which is to invite the reader in and say, okay, you and I are going to play a game together. And in this game, there's going to be a lot of stuff that you get to do. Um, you're going to determine what happens in certain situations. And to do that in a way that doesn't hopefully hit the reader over the head and make them... Uh, you know, feel self-conscious, but but um, but allows them to, in a way, be more creative because I do think the reader creates half of a novel. Yeah, it does. And I, it, it's amazing that you've said that because I do feel that way when I read any of your stuff. Mm. It is very much I'm empowered as well along that with the form. Um, uh, one thing I really want to talk about is uh, when we talk about the West. Obviously, that is you know, usually us, you know, the allies, if you like, us, yes. England, the US. And it's something that I don't like because I disagree with a lot of the decisions. The yep. West does. Yeah. But one of the interesting things is Asia, in particular, Pakistan, is interesting because you have the West, but how different segments of the West views Pakistan as a territory is really interesting because I know in the US, it's obviously, as, as you write in the Reluctant Fundamentalists and other things, um, it is very much this distrust, and we're going to take uh, India's side even when this is happening, and um, you're associated with everything going on in Afghanistan. In Australia, we sort of think, well, Pakistan's all right. Imran Khan's from Pakistan. Yeah. He's okay. Yeah. It's a really interesting dichotomy between those two. I mean, as a Pakistani, how do you, how do you see, um, as an incredibly well-traveled Pakistani, and um, how do you see how the country is viewed by different parts of the West? Well, I think, I think in a way, you know, once you um, start to apply real human beings that you have some familiarity with, this whole idea of what is West and what is East starts to break down really, yeah. really fast. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for example, you know, in an Australian context, you have, you know, Shane Warne, a famous uh, spinner, obviously. Um, and then you had Abdul Qadir, 
who was a 1980s Pakistani spinner, and, and to a certain extent, Shane Warne emerges from a tradition that we saw builders like Abdul Qadir, you know, engaging mm. with in the 1980s. And so, and so there isn't these two completely different things. I mean, you know, would Imran Khan have come into existence without Dennis Lilly? It's, it's um, you know, we, we recognize that we are learning from each other and borrowing from each other. Uh, so, so I think um, I'm very suspicious of terms like the West and the East yeah. and Pakistan and Australia because when I give a reading uh, you know, from a book in Pakistan, I can have any possible reaction, you know. Yeah. Um, people have come up and told me that they find my works offensive and that I explore themes that they think you know, shouldn't be talked about in such an open way. And other people have walked up to me and said you know, that they love the sex scenes and drug scenes in my books. <laughs> and, uh, and those are you know, two different Pakistani reactions. And similarly in Australia, you know, there'll be some people who might come up to me and say, you know, I found that scene in Latin Fundamentalist where Jingis smiles at the instance of September 11th um, uh, really upsetting. Um, and others will say, you know, that actually, in a weird way, I kind of identified with this guy as he was working in the corporate world. And I, when I first took my first corporate job, and so a lot of what I try to do is is to humanize. And also, I think these labels, you know, Pakistan, Australia, East, West, uh, are oversimplifications. Mm. So as a novelist, I view my job as trying to recomplicate what's been oversimplified. Do you find, because of the form that you take in narrative, that people often read it merely as nonfiction? Things that you've written? I mean, a little bit sometimes. Um, I, I have seen my, my most recent novel, How to Get Phil Tirich in Rising Asia, occasionally put in the business section of, news, <laughs> of, of, uh, of bookstores. And in fact, I once had this radio interview uh, in the United States where clearly the host hadn't read the book and had not been very well briefed and, and launched this whole conversation with me about, you know, where should we invest in China and, you know, what, what, <laughs> what sectors would I pick, which I happily engaged in. Yeah, and yeah. I said, well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I'm no expert, but uh, you know, <laughs> cement is looking good, and uh, I think steel is gold. Gold uh, is yes, solid. It's gold. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it can happen. Um, uh, I think um, you know. I, I think part of what uh, informs me as a writer and how I approach this this question is um, I, I do believe that that you know, as a writer, I'm asking a reader to spend time reading my books. And so I need to, in a way, offer something to make a reader want to spend that time. And that something, hopefully, is the pleasure of the plot and the story and other things. And um, I think, as storytellers have done since the first you know, fire was burning and the first clan was gathered around the fire, that first storyteller who stood up and started telling the story, um, you, know, you have to make it worth your audience's while. So I don't want to write literary fiction that sort of bangs you over the head and you have to read because it was well-reviewed or won a prize. I, I want to write fiction which... Um, you pick up and you start, and then once you start, you can't put down, hopefully. Um, but that said, uh, I think that um, it's also, in a way, part of my project, and I think part of literature's project, um, to be a little bit savage and a little bit weird. Um, you know, society produces a lot of conventional stuff, and that's good. But I think one of the things that, you know, the arts are supposed to do is produce some really weird stuff, really crazy stuff, and savage stuff, and and uh, and so I'm I'm interested in doing that. Amen. Mosin Hammond, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Not likewise. And you get all of Mosin's books from Booktopia.com.au right now.